All right, well, thank you, everybody, for uh, coming and, of course, staying for this panel discussion this afternoon. I think we've had a, a very uh, wonderful day of learning about some of the, the challenges that we're running into with respect to reproducibility and science. Um, I also was very happy to see that a number, uh, most of the talks had uh, aspects in there as well about improving uh, the practice, which is very much uh, what we're going to be looking at over the next couple days. Uh, so my name is Andrew Brown. I'm a scientist, too, with the Office of Energetics and the Nutrition Obesity Research Center at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. Uh, and I'm involved in uh, the, the reproducibility discussion, particularly from the focus of uh, nutritional biochemistry, obesity, and statistics, uh, where when in some of my uh, early experiences as a student, um, as I'm sure all of you know, when you read headlines, you see that one day a, a diet's going to be the thing that's going to cure everything, and then the next day it's the thing that's causing all the harms, and sugar's good, sugar's bad, fat's good, fat's bad, and it made my head spin as a student. Um, and that's how I eventually became interested in rigor and reproducibility. Uh, and what I would also like to do at this point is uh, have each one of the, the panelists introduce themselves and explain a little bit of uh, you know, your, your role and things related to today's topic of the, the taxonomy of issues and challenges uh, in to improving research reproducibility. Uh, so if we could go ahead and start with Dr. Verma. Okay, thank you. My name is Indur Verma. I'm an editor-in-chief for PNAS, and I'm also a scientist working in the area of oncology and signal transduction and gene transfer. And uh, First of all, I applaud enormously the efforts of NAS and other societies and organizations to support the idea of uh, um, reproducibility of scientific research. Uh, for me, this is so obvious that actually you have to have a meeting for that. It's kind of odd because that's what we normally want to do. And of course, there are different shades of it we heard today, many, many interesting things. As an editor, actually, a chief, it is a little uncomfortable to see slide after slide we're showing how data is not reproducible, which has been published in, in, in many of the journals, but that's a fact. And uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about my experiences because I'm a life scientist. So it's very different than what you heard from people working in clinical trials. That's a very different experience. So as I was sitting there and I was thinking, I was a graduate, of, how it started with me as a graduate student, which of course was in the last century, long ago. And uh, when we worked as a graduate students nearly four decades ago, we had a very close collaboration with our professors. We small groups, we worked on the bench, we talked to each other all the time, the data was raw, no computers, you had to show to them. We made the reagents, you wrote the paper together, and you really showed the figures to each other, and there was really a lot more input from the advisors in my research, and I learned how to do science that way. And that really was the way science was done, and then, of course, as a postdoc, I continued to do the same. As an assistant professor, I tried to emulate what I started as a student, and then technology became a big part of science. It became really a big deal. Multidisciplinary science has become almost an essentiality if you want to get published papers in reasonably good journals. And then it got out of control for me, at least. I am not as familiar with technology. I had to depend a lot more on my students and postdocs for many of the things. And as a result, I didn't have really as much command on it. That doesn't mean it encourages publishing bad stuff, but it just means the enterprise has gone different and has become much more broader. So situation has changed, and we have to deal with this situation. So I was thinking of what kinds of things today I heard and will be useful. First of all, there's really no question about it. Science is based on science, and therefore verification and reproducibility essential component. I also want to add very quickly, before I forget to mention this, is this idea that science is self-correctional is good in our minds, but that is not buying in the public anymore. This idea that we keep saying science is self-corrected is not getting the same traction in public because every day there is some news. Even today in New York Times, you saw article that there is something wrong with science because things are not reproducible. So I think we have the onerous responsibility to do it right, not necessarily just depend on the fact science will automatically correct itself. There are two parties to this business, the authors who write the paper 
and the editors in the journal who publish the paper. <clears throat> we have to really depend on the trust, but it's now trust which has to be verified, and the verification is really done by the editors. It's a big job. Just think about PNAS. We have 17,000 papers. 8,000 papers are sent out for review that call for over 15,000 reviewers. And each one, and they have to be experts in the field. They have to be, because at the end of the day, they are the one who are going to make a decision of the veracity of the work, quality of the work. While it is true, we have an obligation as editors and as editor-in-chief and as our staff to make sure that a lot of the data is reproducible, but we are not in a position. Maybe there are others. We are not in a position to take every figure and ask the question, is it the right figure? Is the data correctly presented over here? Is the tables correct? Is every paper a statistical value? We have to depend heavily on the editors. And that is a task which is difficult to do because to find editors is already hard to do it. So we have to encourage them to be even more responsible for that. And finally, I, because my other colleagues have probably more important things to say, I should add, though, that it becomes much more important now to educate our students. And it has to start really from the graduate school even earlier, that why is it essential that what you do is reproducible, because that's the basis of science. We have to have much more input of the faculty into it. I see my younger faculty now who basically actually don't really work in the lab anymore. They sit on the computer in part to write grants to raise money for it. But it is a, something we have to inculcate very early on, the teaching part of it. And it can't just be a two-hour course on the, on, on the computer where you just have to sign off. People have to really understand the implications. Why is it essential that if you want to do good science, you have to be able to be somebody can replicate and reproduce because that's the most urgent part of the science we need to do. The funding agencies have also a very important role to play. They, they can, in fact, at the end of the day, they have a very important role to play to ensure that the science we do is reproducible because the rewards of it being funded has to depend on that. Finally, I think time has come for us to also think, what are the implications for people who do not follow these procedures? I think the society, particularly the scientific society, has become extremely polite. We don't really challenge our colleagues when they actually do these kinds of things. There's almost no, many often there's no, there's no effect on the outcome for many of the people because many of the things they have done takes five years, six years, 10 or 20 years before it comes to fruition, and there really is very little consequences for that. I'm not saying there should be punishments and so on, but I think there is little consequence and we have to make sure that people understand that there are going to be consequences if they do not, both at the level of funding and at the level of how your colleagues perceive you. And finally, I think somebody mentioned that, and I agree completely, there's an enormous uh, multiplication of journals. And uh, today what David talked about, I must admit, although I don't like any subject on obesity, it doesn't make me feel good, but the 80% of the journals that you mentioned today, I didn't recognize them at all. It's easier to get started in a new journal than to get a driver's license in California. <laughs> so I think and there's really no, nobody who is checking them. What's their value to them? Who are the authors? Are they appropriate? Because people don't really make a distinction when it's advertised over there. So I think we have to think some way of dealing with you. So, I think it's a very important subject. I'm very glad that the Sackler Symposium is on it, and I look forward to also, I enjoyed many of the talks. I look forward to hearing more and my colleagues and their opinions. So I pass on to another real professional here. <laughs> okay, so I'm Philip Campbell, and I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Nature and of Nature Publications. And I wanted to focus, in answer to your question, on the role of the editors, at least within the Nature Group. So. Um, we're run by professional editors, if I can use that word, i.e. people whose full-time job is to be an editor. They are ex-researchers themselves, but they have chosen to be full-time editors, getting out into the labs, getting out into conferences, keeping abreast of the literature in all sorts of ways. And um, so the, the deficiencies you see in the nature journals are 
my responsibility and their responsibility more directly perhaps than in, in some of the other journals. Um, we became aware of deficiencies in the journals, especially in my case. I should perhaps just add that I was a physicist originally. I grew up in a lab, as it were, in research in a project that was much simpler than some of the projects you've seen discussed today. And the culture in the lab was that if I made any interesting claim about what I was discovering, my supervisor assumed that it was a, a collaboration between Mother Nature and my equipment to tell a lie. And I really had to work to convince him if ever I really thought I'd got something interesting. And I do have a, a general worry, having been thinking about the, all of these topics for several years now, that that is decreasingly either operationally possible within research groups or the culture within research groups. So that's my sort of top level sociological comment. But in terms of what the We Are the Nature group did, we published in 2012 a comment article by Begley and Ellis, which was, I think, one of the early ones, not the first, but one of the early ones to show how unreplicable the high impact literature was. It had its own defects, that study, but nevertheless, it was a real wake up call for me. And then a year later, roughly, we published an editorial and a set of initiatives, including a checklist, um, which would help editors and authors and referees try and ensure <coughs> that at least the deficiencies were more transparently displayed. If you hadn't done randomization, you didn't necessarily have to do it, but you had to make it clear you hadn't. The statistics, if you had used error bars, you were sure that you were right to use those particular sorts of error bars, and so on and so forth. That actually immediately introduced a workload for everybody, including the editors, so it was a real commitment to fulfill it. We also did a few other things, but I want to just focus on that checklist because you wouldn't necessarily know that that's been operated with over the last three years because there's no measure as yet available as to what effect all of that has had. Somebody earlier on mentioned non-compliance, so we are tightening up on that one. So very shortly, we will be publishing the checklist for each paper with the paper so readers can see whether there's been compliance. And that, of course, will put pressure on us to make sure, as best we can, that there's been compliance. But it is true that non-compliance <coughs> is a real issue. The other thing we have been doing, the checklist we introduced was fairly basic, generic stuff within life sciences, experimental life sciences. Um, I think the problem seems to be much greater in that area and in psychology, for example, and I'm not talking about clinical research because we're not in clinical research than in physics or chemistry or the earth sciences, although all those disciplines have their problems. And where they do have problems, we have introduced or beginning to introduce some extra little checklists. So we've introduced a checklist for fMRI studies, we've introduced a checklist for laser physics, we've introduced a checklist for photovoltaics, where there were too much sloppy descriptions of what was going on, too much um, inadequate descriptions that referees and we, so we're sharing the blame, and the authors were letting into the papers. So at least, I hope, we're tightening up on the description of the papers. Whether the work is actually becoming more reproducible, re reproducible is perhaps a different question. So um, I don't want to go on too long. I think what we've done is really try to take some initiatives to tighten up the process, the workflow, if you like, of publishing. But there are, of course, other cultural issues that presumably we'll come on to, which I would be glad to talk about. Okay, so I'm, I'm Ginny Barber. I'm, uh, I'm, I guess I'm here as the chair of COPE, which is Committee on Publication Ethics, which is a, an organisation of 11,000 members globally across all disciplines from very basic science through to um, sort of clinical medicine and, and humanities. Um, my other interests, though, are that I, I was an editor until a couple of years ago. I worked at, at the Public Library of Science. I was one of the editors that started PLOS Medicine. And we had a real culture at PLOS Medicine of... Um, reproducibility, so actually we were the first journal to require protocols to be published, at the t submitted and published at the time of, uh, for all clinical trials. We spent a lot of time on checklists and such like, so I have a background in, in trying to, uh, to get these things implemented and it's, it, it's been you know, a, a challenge I would say. Um, I also have an interest in open access, so that's where my job is now, um, and I also have an academic position at one of the <coughs> universities in Australia. Um, where I have a role that's split between the Office of Research Ethics and Integrity and the Library um, in a sort of fairly unique, so it's a terrible thing, a unique collaboration, <coughs> um, in, in where we're trying at a university level to um, implement some things to improve integrity. So, um, so I guess that my, my perspective 
at this point is that, first of all, I think that this whole discussion is, is part of academic integrity overall. It's not just about reproducibility, and I think that we should constantly frame it like that. Um, I actually think that we have a, 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 an amazing opportunity right now to exploit the new technologies that are coming along to allow us to really um, improve integrity. So I would say things like, we don't, we're not, we don't have to be stuck with the traditional um, model of a paper anymore. We can have evolving things that allow revisions, that allow us to have data sets that are linked to papers. We can do, we can do the most astonishing um, linkages that we were never able to do before. And I think that you know, <laughs> having a data set attached to a paper, that was unheard of when I first came into publishing, which was uh, yeah, 15 years ago or so. So that's the, that's what the first thing. I think we also have an academic, we have the opportunity to change the academic culture, and I think that where we see many of these issues arising is because we have an academic culture that currently um, is, people are only rewarded for the, the publication in Nature, Cell Science, and you know, the PLOS journals and the top journals. That's a real problem because we know people have to get jobs, they have to get their grants, and um, universities are very, very fond of league tables that uh, are based on journal publishing statistics. And until we are able to change that substantially, I think that we are not going to be able to change the culture <coughs> systematically. Um, but we also have this, as well as all of these other things, we have an explosion of innovation that's happening right now. And I, you know, my personal opinion is that is tied to the uh, increasing openness that we're seeing in the, um, in the ap academic culture. And we, c we can tie this all together um, into something that is, um, you know, that is a much better um, future. But to come back to where COPE sits in all of this, so we have 11,000 member uh, journals from around the world. We also have representatives of pretty much the, all the big <coughs> publishers. Um, and we see that most of these member journals actually are run by people who are not full-time editors. So I was lucky enough to be a full-time editor. Philip what is. Um, many editors aren't. They work under extraordinary circumstances, editing their journals in the middle of the night um, with often very limited resources. Um, and struggling with some very big issues. So the types of challenges that we're seeing at COPE, for <coughs> example, are people you know, attempting to um, uh, falsify the peer review system, to, to sort of fake, fake, submit fake papers, submit fake reviews. And I think that when we're talking about the t uh, reproducibility, we have to be cognizant of all the other things that are happening in publishing right now. It's a very challenging place, I think, for academics and journals and editors to be in. So um, I think this is a great discussion. I, I'm, I'm an optimist, and I think that we have the tools to solve this right now, but I do think we have to be thinking <coughs> across all of the disciplines, across all of the possible, <coughs> all the groups that are involved in it, and actually to think about the technology that we can apply as well. I'm uh, Veronique Kiermer. I'm executive editor at the Public Library of Science. Uh, and um, I, so I, I, I'm an editor, a professional editor, uh, and I work very closely with all the, uh, the, the editorial teams of the seven plus journals, which include some professional editors for plus biology and medicine, for example, as well as journals that are run by the community, um, by people who have a day job uh, as academics. And, uh, and, and so I, I see both sides of, of that. Mm -hmm. And I've been very interested in, in all these uh, uh, discussions about reproducibility that have um, really bubbled up since, I think, 2012, uh, as, as Phil was mentioning. Um, and I've seen a lot of manifestations in mostly biomedical um, basic research, uh, a lot of manifestations of these um, uh, issues of lack of reproducibility, uh, mainly around um, uh, problematic experimental design and al analytical design, um, in particular um, around areas where um, uh, measures of to uh, prevent bias are not being applied as they should be. Uh, very difficult reagents uh, that are not re reagents themselves being not reproducible, um, and also um, uh, misguided use of statistics uh, associated with the issues of, of experimental design. One thing that, that, that I want, I mean, I'm, I'm an optimist too, and, and I think one, one thing that I want to point out is that in, in basic research at least, um, to some extent, it is cause for celebration because we are working with incredibly complex system. The fact that science is able to interrogate incredibly complex system, we're talking about living animals, with a lot of parameters that we don't control, that the experimentators don't control, is actually a feat, and it's actually cause for celebration to a point. Obviously, 
we have to acknowledge the limitations of doing that. And, and there are uh, elements in the scientific method that allows us to protect ourselves from bias, from experimental bias and experimentative bias and analytical bias, which I think perhaps um, ha have not been as, um, as applied, um, as, as broadly taught and educate, uh, in our education system as, as they should be. But, but I think that overall, with this technology moving forward, we actually are in a, in a very exciting place in, in science. I also think that over the past five years, um, I followed really what, what has happened at the level of journals to try to, to deal with these issues. And I actually think that a lot of it uh, is happening. Uh, Phil mentioned guidelines. Uh, you know, we, we had the, the, the you've, you've heard about the clinical guidelines that, that uh, predates what's happened, but have been a very good model for what has happened in, in basic research, in preclinical research. Um, there's, been, there's been a very clear move to um, openness as well. And uh, I mean, one thing that I'm, I'm particularly interested in close to is, is, is data and really being ab able to uh, publish data with papers. Uh, the, the PLOS journals have introduced a policy in 2014 that demands that data is published at, with the paper at the time of publication. For, for the longest time, it was based on data will be made uh, available upon request. And reality is that this is a very difficult thing. It's been proven not to work extremely well uh, because it's very difficult to, to, uh, to ensure compliance in that. And so the PLOS journals decided that they were going to require data at the time of publication. Um, that's been, I mean, it's been a massive in undertaking in implementation. It's been a lot of work on uh, our staff and our editors. Um, but really, you know, almost three years down the line now, I think we are, start, we are starting, these things take time, but we are starting to see a real difference. We, we've published close to 60,000 papers that have a data availability statement that tells you exactly where you find the data. We've seen an increase in the position of data in, in public repositories. We've seen an increase in, our, in the comments that editors and reviewers make that are re relevant to data. So I think there is, there, the, the community is responding to that. And, and I think it's, it, it's time now to start looking back at all these measures that have been introduced and really, and really see what, what the, um, the effect is. Um, an, another element of, of, so all of that is really around transparency. I think we still have a lot to do around transparency of methodologies and, and reagents. Um, another aspect of transparency, I think, which is very important in my view, is, is the, the transparency of author contributions. And, and this goes back to talking about the system of incentives. Um, our current system of reward in preclinical research is based on rewarding exploratory um, studies with small sample size, uh, uh, big effects, um, uh, novelty, and, and not necessarily rewarding confirmatory research, which is done differently. It's not necessarily um, uh, implemented in that way. And I think that being able to shift that view to a view that values open science with the sense of not just open access to, to the science, but open access to the data, to the methodologies, with a, with a view to reuse all that, and really valuing the contributions of individuals on these research projects that, that work on that is going to be very important. So I think that this is another aspect of, of uh, which is in, incredibly important. At the end of the day, the system of incentives is really what underpins everything and, and, uh, and something we have to work on. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm the odd duck up here, actually, because I'm a physical scientist. Uh, I'm also a vice president for research uh, at my uh, home school, and I also have been 12 years on the National Science Board. So I'm kind of bringing a federal, federal agency perspective, uh, a research officer perspective, and a meteorologist perspective. And when I thought we were going to talk about reliability, I'm like, you guys really want a meteorologist in the room? Seriously, right? I mean, <laughs> you know, we've probably done more to kind of undermine the notion of statistics <laughs> and what the general population thinks 40% means than anybody on the planet. So my apologies on behalf of meteorologists everywhere. When you hear a 40% chance of rain, go look up and see what that means. It's probably not what you really think it means. So uh, anyway, um, in my day job as a vice president for research, I'm concerned a lot about the issue of reproducibility, uh, especially the institutional role and responsibility for helping faculty and researchers and students learn how to do solid experimental design. I really think this is an imperative for the institution. So uh, many institutions uh, have sort of central operations there. They, of course, teach courses. 
But for folks who are not skilled in some of the, the methodologies of, say, the social behavioral sciences, uh, you know, do, do they have access, ready access, to folks who can join a team for some period of time? Not be their programmer, like some computer scientists are thought of, which is not a good thing, but really to join as a scholarly endeavor. So that is something we're very keen about, I think, in, in APLU and AAU, talking about those kinds of things, making sure that at the very front end of the experimental design, conceding the idea of what you're trying to do, that that really gets a, an important play, that the institution has a response responsibility for that. The other thing, of course, is this issue of, of the, the boundary between reproducibility, irreproducibility, and research misconduct. And it gets to the issues of rewards. It gets to the issue of collaboration on what are we really uh, you know, evaluating people on in our system. We talk about collaboration and, and, and working together, but at universities, it's pretty much, what did you do the last year? What papers did you publish? We're getting better as, a, as the academy, but you know, we still have a long ways to go. So I think that's an important thing to, that I really am concerned about working with provosts and so on. Um, from the science board perspective, um, I was 12 years on the board, so I had a chance to really talk a lot and work a lot with Congress on a lot of issues about uh, the, the value of research and, and you know, are we really funding things that are going to uh, sort of bring immediate benefits and the value of basic research versus other kinds of research. And I think, you know, if you look at, look at the last uh, science and engineering indicators that came out in 2016, there's one very important graph, and there's a lot of them, but there's one very important graph that asks the question uh, of public leadership institutions. Uh, what, what do you have the most trust in? And second, only to the military is the scientific community. So we're riding a really important high wave, and it's been traditionally high. It's had some ups and downs, but it's been quite high relative to other things. You could guess what's at the bottom. You could go look at the graph. I could tell you, but you can go look at the graph. What is at the very bottom, and we're right next to the top. So the, the point is, I don't think we want to mess that up. So this is kind of an important moment that we have to realize as we're having this wonderful colloquium to do exactly what we're doing to address some of these issues. So the, the uh, oversight is very, very important, that the role that Congress plays. Also, <coughs> inspectors general, uh, other folks who ensure compliance. You know, it's about behavior. Ultimately, compliance is about sort of you know, getting the behavior that you want in, in folks. The problem is that we're seeing a drift in compliance in this country. We're seeing it all over the spectrum. I think the National Academies had a report that, that spoke to this very issue. There's a drift toward much more of an enforcement mindset than a, hey, we're here to help you figure out how to do it right to begin with mindset. And I think that's part of the community that we have to work with. We have to rebuild that trust relationship. But frankly, there's factors at play that are far beyond what, uh, what any of us really have control over. So I think that's a really important thing. As a physical scientist, one of the things I deal with a lot is observational data. And uh, this gets into issues of quality control. And if you read the newspapers, you see there's a lot of debate about climate studies and correcting for historical data and trends and temperature records and so on and so forth. And quality control, quality analysis is extremely important. It's just like coding analyses from surveys. But there are, there are ways to do it and there are ways not to do it. And I think the problem that we have is that, as we heard early in the question and answer period, we sort of debate among ourselves, well, that's a healthy thing. A lot of folks don't realize that, that that healthy debate is what advances science. They see it as, as discord and, and, and strife in the community. And, well, you guys just can't seem to decide. Well, science very rarely gives us a yes answer that's definitive. You know, we all know that. But we need to educate others to, to really get that as well. I think it's, that's, uh, that's very important. I really do think open access is really going to, to be a game changer in this area. Uh, it's going to have some pluses and some minuses. I think as the publication concept moves away from journal articles into research releases that really announce something that is a continuous publication over the next five or six years on the web that is just building upon a previous activity and the data are right there, everything is right there, and even the code is right there, um, I think that's going to be a game changer. It's also going to invite a lot of additional burden on our colleagues, our researchers, who are going to have to answer lots of questions that they didn't have to answer before. But again, I think we, we'll figure out how to deal with that. And I think that's really uh, very, very healthy for science. Um, the other thing I would just like to point out, and Victoria brought forth a, a really good uh, you know, lexicon. We still haven't sort of agreed upon that. And you know, there's a lot of nuance to this. It's like when the Science Board did its report on the STEM workforce. You know, back then it was, well, we have too many STEM workers here. Oh, we don't have enough here. And when you really peel back the layers of the onion, what you find is in a lot of things, there's a lot of nuance and detail to it. And that's very, very important detail. So I think that as we, we move forward in these conversations, if we can kind of agree to what we mean by these various terms, 
reproducing my results with my data, reproducing my results with somebody else's data, you know, getting consistency and stuff versus using completely different data, completely different model, like a model of the Earth system. How can you reproduce that? I mean, you know, it's a chaotic, dynamical system. Do we understand how that figures into the notion of reproducibility, a.k.a. Ed Lorenz and the, the, uh, uh, the discovery of chaos theory, you know, 50 years ago? So lots of great challenges out there. I'm an optimist, too. I really do think that we're going to deal with a lot of these things. We're going to figure it out. But remember, the scientific method is something we invented, okay? So we can never operate outside its boundaries. And sometimes I think, as we talked about today, as we sort of enlarge our thinking about some other aspects of the method that may need to be modified to encompass these much more complicated problems that, frankly, in a journal article, will never be reproducible. A climate system model uh, simulation over a thousand years, you know, you might be able to reproduce some parts of it. Can you put everything in the article to reproduce all of it? Not even close. Not even close. So I, I love the discussion. I love the fact that we're, you know, we've got physical science brought into the mix of the life sciences, and I look forward to be a part of it. Thank you. Well, thank, uh, thanks to all of you. Um, so clearly a very broad range of expertise. Um, and one thing that I would like to build on uh, with what you just mentioned is comparing and contrasting a little bit. Uh, a lot of what we heard today was either uh, life sciences based or you know, statistics, or you know, in some cases, statistics applied to life sciences, but not as much about physical sciences or earth sciences and things like that. And um, you know, you've uh, shared a couple things as, as did you, Dr. Campbell. Um, if, if anybody wants to build on the idea of how does uh, challenges in non-life sciences compare and contrast with some of the things that we've seen in, in biomedical, um, and for uh, anybody that wants to add anything about you know, the very basic sciences as well, um, if anybody wants to contribute to I that. I can have a go. Um, so I, I think that I, I, I would point to two generic things that actually affect all of these sciences, but which lead, therefore, to the problems in physical sciences as well as biology. Um, so one is the data access question. And um, the thing that doesn't ever really get discussed, it seems to me, is the cost of data access and who's going to cover it. And then there's another thing, which is a real challenge for vice presidents of university, <laughs> and I really want to challenge you, is the role of the, the principal investigator in the outputs of science. And if you look at the increasing pressures on principal investigators, coming from people like us demanding more, um, the lack from funding agencies who want more reproducibility of money to really support mm -hmm. that extra reproducibility in terms of time and effort, if you look at those pressures accumulating and you look at the bigger pressures of you know, needing to publish, needing to get the next grant, all of that, it seems to me, is undermining with good demands, actually, a lot of them, the, the PI's ability to do what he or she really ought to be doing. So what are the universities doing about that? I, I, it's a very good point. I think, number one, we've got to get success rates up higher because otherwise people are you know, writing proposal after proposal just to stay alive, and, and therefore they're sacrificing, obviously, uh, some of the, the, the time that they need to have for these other things. The other thing, of course, is compliance, and I think that you know, if you look at the two studies that were done by the Federal Demonstration Partnership, uh, consistent results, 42% of, of federally funded faculty time on research grants is spent on administrative activities. And that's just, that's just ridiculous. And, and so the current administration, I think, is keen on reducing regulatory burden. Well, let's get in there and let's get it done. I think we've got a better opportunity to do that now than we've had in a long, long time. But I think it really is, you're putting the burden where it belongs. It belongs on the institution. I mean, ultimately, faculty respond to their deans, their chairs, the provosts, the messaging there. And, and sometimes there's just not you know, very strong messaging along the lines of what you're talking about. So I very much appreciate what you said and agree with it. I f follow that on because I think the, um, there is another, uh, as well as the institutions, there's also a, um, th there's something that has to be done at the national level. So I'll give the example of Australia and um, we, so I don't sound Australian but I am, uh, I live in Australia <laughs> and there is a, um, an initiative there called the Australian National Data Service, mm. Any, I don't know if anyone's heard of it. Um, it's an absolutely phenomenal um, nationally funded resource. Um, which was, it's essentially infrastructure for data. So about five years ago, a large chunk of money was put in um, because somebody in government realised there was a need to have a national infrastructure to handle the types of data that was coming out of Australian institutions. 
um, and it's a phenomenal um, organization. It is very far thinking. It's been, for example, a leader in how you think about citing data, which is very important when we're talking about um, incentives for researchers. Um, Australia is a very big country, but it has a relatively small number of people in it, and you can get a consensus pretty quickly. You can, there are two major funding agencies, and uh, they have a, uh, a code for the responsible conduct research in Australia, um, and everybody jumps when they change it, because if you breach the code as an institution, you may end up having to give back a very large funding grant. So there, you know, there is strength in the fact that it's um, able to be quite small, able to drive policy. And so I think the combination of having you know, a strong code that's well implemented, uh, but putting the infrastructure in place, so institutions don't have to think about, you know, do I have to build this or that or the other? Or, um, authors don't have to say, you know, I, I get, don't have my data available because it's on a USB stick. Well, actually, you know, you just press a button and somebody will put it in a repository for you. You don't even have to do it. And I think that type of thing, that, that has been, uh, I think has been a, a huge missed opportunity uh, internationally, actually. If I were to just add to the same question, one of the big changes that have occurred now with the online publication is the methodology can be added on. For a long time, many journals just cut down on methods. In fact, they went from the front page to the back page, and that really where a lot of reproducibility depended on that. And I think, for example, journals like now Nature Methods and Protocols add to that, and I think that I'm very optimistic will actually improve the ability of people to read. Despite the fact, I agree with Veronica, the science is very complex. In vivo mouse models are very different in different types of it. It's not a justification for sloppy work. That's not what I'm saying. But I think now you have no excuse that your method should not be reproducible largely because there is no reason why journals should not publish completely the methodology used for that publication. If I may add on the, I completely agree with the need for infrastructures. I think that it's, it's something, and, it's, and it's, not, it's not an easy solution, and it's not the hot potato that we should send one, from one stakeholder group to another. I think there is really a, a need for durable, consistent infrastructure, and, and, and that's very difficult to, to fund and to maintain. Uh, and it's true in terms of data. It's absolutely... A, Okay. And it's true also, I think, at the level of, of institutions in, in terms of the support. If you think about core facilities, um, uh, data management uh, support and storage and all that, all these things that could be local or, or, or regional or national or international are actually incredibly important. And it's, it's not given the, the, the priority that, that it should have. I think. Thank you. Uh, I did want to, to follow up on one thing uh, that you said, uh, Dr. Fermo, which is about um, how often now people seem almost too polite or politically correct. Um, I can see some circumstances where uh, that is true, uh, but there have also been a number of um, pretty uh, fairly high-profile instances of late with, um, uh, and we're going to hear a talk, I believe, tomorrow. Uh, with the term, you know, the, the methodological terrorism or the example Dr. Allison gave earlier of the, the researcher that's really being um, just gone after um, in, a, in a very vicious uh, approach. And the idea is, uh, I guess the question I have for each of you is how do we get to a point where we can address a number of the, the issues that have been brought up today uh, in a way that is more collaborative and supportive. Um, I tend, you know, with the, the optimism comment, I usually assume if somebody made a mistake in a paper that they're not being malicious about it. It's something they either didn't know or overlooked or um, the examples of the, the comparing two different baseline uh, comparisons and assuming it's significant. So I approach it that way when I see an error and I try to contact the authors and um, try to improve things that way. But that's very slow, um, and that's you know a very long post-publication type of uh, uh, approach to this. Uh, what thoughts do any of you have in terms of how can we add pressure to get these things corrected without it, I guess, giving up the respectful attitude that we should have with each other as humans? Well, first of all, I don't promote tweets. <laughs> it's not a good idea to complain <laughs> against people. But I think it is. We see people in meetings and so on very often, and by word of mouth you know that this is not a reproducible work. 
And I think we are just being too polite to people and not walk up to them and say, not publicly, that you know, we can't reproduce this work. What does it take us to do that? And that's all I got, what I meant was that because the majority of the people, I think, I believe, do not deliberately cause fraud. It's just the difficulty of reproducing certain data. And I think, to me, it's more sloppiness. It's not actually a really thing. It's sloppiness, not <coughs> doing sufficiently enough number of experiments to come to a point where you can say, this is based on this what we are doing. So what I was referring to was really more our own challenge to our colleagues if there is something obviously wrong, to talk to them about it. That's what I meant. Thank you. Um, I, I can have a couple of anecdotes. So I won a bottle of champagne off the first chief editor of PLOS One because I had a bet with him on the BBC program, actually, in public, that they would get no comments on their papers, or very few. He, he was a real advocate for commenting on papers. And uh, would that he would, that he got it, but actually it didn't. It, that's one of the phenomenon that you, you, what phenomena we see. We do not get comments on papers. You do get comments on third-party sites, and some of them they can be vicious, but they are some of them genuinely critically minded, and it's part of our job as editors to pick up on those. We'll pick up on anonymous comments sent to us and look at them and act on them as a real tip-off that we ought to look at. Um, and the, but the other thing where I think we're deficient at the moment, definitely speaking just for the, for the Nature Group, because we're really looking into this, we do publish critiques of our papers, but it's a very slow process. And uh, there are all, re all sorts of reasons for why it's slow, and I'm not, we won't, I mean, anyone here will probably understand why that kind of slow, if you're, if, especially if you involve the authors of the original study, which I think you have to. But I, but, but I do agree with anyone who says that that post-publication integrity of really trying to get out there as fast as possible, even just an expression of concern by the editors, is a really important thing. And I, I do think that's something, whether it's done in a seemly way or not, is, is to me sort of slightly a, a second order issue. Because obviously it's up to editors to try and make sure it is seemly, but the social media make that almost impossible. Even for us as editors, mm. it's very difficult even for expression of concern to get it done. You know, are we at, I am involved in several of them now. Uh, by the time we get to them, it's months and years. And then all the threats from the other side, then the lawyers from the other side, even just for expression of concern, which is obvious in this case. So it, it, it takes a lot of time. And I don't know how to shorten this, because there is a, I think the sooner it goes to the people, the better it is, so that people know that this is not the right line of investigation. So, so I, th I think. This is something we think about a lot at COPE. I mean, I, I, so I make three points. First of all, I think that we're in a, we're in a very new p place at the moment. You know, I, the, the only journal that ever did um, pu publication, commenting well on their journal um, was the, the British Medical Journal. You know, they had a very a thriving um, uh, post-publication uh, system when it was letters to the editor. Um, and they tra they've translated that into a, th into a thriving um, community, which is generally polite on yeah. their website. So they, they did it very well from the beginning, and it was a sort of clearly a community that expected to behave in that way, and they, they continued that. Um, other journals have tried to reproduce it, and I very well remember the, the PLOS, <laughs> the fact that we weren't able to get um, comments in the way that we wanted to. And one of the reasons that uh, we've we found was because actually the system was very clunky. It was actually quite hard to put a comment on one of the papers, whereas it's very easy to tweet, you know. So we had people that were, very, from the very beginning, were putting, criticizing papers on Twitter, but not putting them onto the, onto the paper themselves. And that, that was very frustrating for us. But I think, I think, again, we have an opportunity here. We have an opportunity to move away from a static paper because we, all ex we are currently in this, in this state where the expectation is the paper is static, and that that is what has to be prized, and you have to have this precious jewel of a paper that can't be criticised. And I, I, whether or not we, um, academics feel very challenged when they get criticisms of their papers. Editors get very challenged, and you know one of the things that we uh, we did at COPE a couple of years ago was write some guidelines for editors on what to do when they were challenged by um, people who sent them comments, particularly comments that were um, anonymous and often quite rude or challenging or you know, certainly not respectful <coughs> in the way that editors, I think, sometimes hope that they might be addressed. And the, the initial instinct of any human being when they're criticized in that way is to ignore it, is to turn away from it 
and not engaged. And, and that's what was happening. And so the, then the, the dialogue will get more angrier and angrier. And what may well have been a legitimate concern, which perhaps could have been handled early on, turned into something that was very toxic quite quickly. So we've tried to um, develop some guidelines for that. So I think that I think the opportunity is that we can develop papers that become living papers. So I'd like to see us much more move to models where you can revise things easily. We are actively thinking about processes for how you would have corrections uh, of various sorts post-publication that are much easier to do. I completely agree with you that it can be hard to do expressions of concern. And part of that is because you often link it with the... Um, with the motive and so once you're once you have the motive linked to the correction itself it becomes almost impossible to do a correction because then you have to prove what why something happened and that can be very difficult whereas what we actually want to do is correct the literature as quickly as we can um, but then the final thing i would just say is um i think that there there is a very big issue with um the online um culture around publications at the moment i don't quite know how we as an uh as a <coughs> allowed it to degenerate in the way that it has, but it has degenerated. Um, I personally feel that the fact that we don't give credit to people for constructive criticism, and this is tied into the fact that we don't give credit for reviewers still in a, in a systematic way. You know, we do it somewhat, on, you know, Publons, for example, is trying to do that. Um, it's not really until things like PubMed Commons, which I know we're going to hear about tomorrow, has come along where there is a, a constructive public place to air comments that you can get credit for that we have really seen um, the opportunity for that to happen. And at, whereas at, at the same time, we've allowed a very toxic online anonymous culture to grow. And I think as, as academics, we just <coughs> have to 